When I talk about Magic the Gathering literature and lore, I am often told I should not expect much from the story, least of all in the quality of the written word. It's just fantasy stories for kids, I have been told again and again in the comments. It's not going to be Tolkien. But I reject that premise, and so should you. Because just because a story is written for children, or for teenagers, or for young adults, does not mean it can't be excellent. I can name hundreds of children's stories that, despite the age of their targeted audience, are works of great skill and craft and contain meaning. I have read young adult novels that convey a more deep and complex understanding of the world around us than their quote-unquote mature literary counterparts, comic books that have resonated with me to the point of tears, and yes, even genre fiction that was commissioned by a corporation to help sell a game that nonetheless is a stirring and moving work of Yes, literature. I can even already name countless, countless works of existing Magic the Gathering fiction that is exemplary in these areas. From the stories of Ixalan by Alison Lurz, which are widely believed to be some of the greatest writing Magic the Gathering has ever known, to stories like Lorraine's Smile, Jace Alone, The Truth of Names, Born of Aether, and on and on, splaying out before me like stars in a sky. So please, do not cave in to the fallacy that, just because this is something written for kids, or young adults, or is science fiction fantasy, or a graphic novel, or a Magic the Gathering novel, that it is unable to be anything other than cheap potboiler prose. Words are powerful things, and regardless of genre or audience, if they are crafted with love and care by an author with a purpose and meaningful intent, they can transport us as an audience to new planes of existence. I say all this in my preamble because, in my evaluation, War of the Spark, Forsaken by Greg Weissman, is not a work crafted by an author who had purpose or intent, beyond perhaps the intent of ticking off a checklist of questionable demands and a deadline to meet. It is rushed, superficial, outright sloppy throughout, and even biphobic at points, as I will get to in a moment. In short, as a book for kids, it is what those kids would call a... bad. And the fact that it is a Magic the Gathering novel is no excuse. Before we begin, let me remind you that, as always, I will indicate before this review gets into spoilers. I would like to begin by discussing language and prose. This is a bit difficult for me, simply because the internet has been abuzz with people highlighting various sentences and passages from the novel already, and so I am going to strive to latch onto a few parts that I have not seen widely addressed. I would, of course, like to stress that these are only a few examples of the novel's prose. They are not the exception. They are the rule. As with the previous novel, War of the Spark, characters do not act or speak distinctly. They share phrases and expressions and sound usually like one voice, I assume the author's, when speaking. Niv Mizzet, with Marie watching, said, Don't screw this up, Zarek. Mmm, yes, that does sound like Niv Mizzet, Draco genius and firemind of Ravnica, whose flavor text of thought is often expressed in so intelligent a manner it takes the form of a mathematical equation. Let's compare this line of dialogue from Niv Mizzet to previous dialogue from Niv back when people who understood the character wrote the story. Niv Mizzet spoke, and his voice was thunder. This method, he boomed, in the manner of a judge condemning a defendant to death, 
is demonstrably unreliable. Ral nodded. I'm sorry, Firemind. I shouldn't have allowed the other team members to adjust the detections. It was my responsibility. Project terminated, snarled the dragon, spreading his wings and chopping at the air, his great body ascending. You'll have to rethink this entirely if you ever want to prove something of merit. That passage is written by an author who knows just who and what Niv Mizzet is. In that, the dragon's language is formal, powerful, and rooted in scientific and operational cadences. The words used to describe the firemind's tone and actions have meaning. They further the character and establish their presence. Words matter. Words create and build and convey not only idea, but character. They bring these people to life, or in the case of this novel, I feel fail to do so. Raoul chuckled to himself. I'm just revealing my stupidity. Please don't make me reveal my stupidity out loud. I can imagine, he said, and he could. Are you trying to make me angry, period? It was not a question. And while people have certainly latched on to ridiculous passages, of which there are plenty, what I find more appalling is wasteful prose of examples such as, I can imagine, and he could. Hmm? He could do the thing he said he could do, and he did. He did it, the thing he said. It was done, because it was something he could do, which is why he said it. At times, the prose itself doesn't seem to understand what it is doing or who is speaking. Take this example. Tessa Karlov, scion and now matriarch of the most prominent family in the Orzov Syndicate, was in her chambers. Well, of course I'm in my chambers. I've been confined to these same rooms for the equivalent of an eternity. So we are told through the narrator, who is not a character in the novel, that Tessa is in her chambers. And then Tessa, thinking to herself, responds to the narrator as though she can see the third person narration, and her response is to repeat what that narrator has said. She's replying to the narrator by thinking to herself? What? All while adding no new information. This passage is really just, Tessa Karlov was in her chambers. Weissman has written it in a demonstrably sloppy, convoluted, and questionable manner. Words matter. In literature, they are the world itself and have the ultimate power. So how is the novel structured? As with the original War of the Spark novel, each chapter is told from the perspective of a singular character, although the perspective is often loose and ill-defined once that chapter gets going, if indeed that chapter has anywhere to go. I say this because the chapters are usually extremely short. Again, there's a feeling of rushing through each moment to get to the next. Check off a box and hurry through. Back and forth dialogue is leaned on heavily. This chapter here is about five sentences long. It's not even half a page. It might as well be a bullet point. The novel itself is divided into three parts, and the plot is driven by three primary characters. Kaya, who is tasked with hunting down Liliana Vess, Vraska, who is tasked with hunting down Dovin Bon, and Ryle Zarek, who is tasked with hunting down Tezzeret. While many of the other characters from the previous novel are present, from Jace to Jaya to the Wanderer to an awful lot of Teo and Rat, the plot itself is centered around the hunt for Bolas's accomplices. This positions the primary characters of this novel as Kaya, Ral, and Vraska, and the other characters and their problems as secondary. I want to point out that War of the Spark is essentially the end of the Gatewatch's multi-year saga. Whatever your opinion of the Gatewatch has been, it's been the primary narrative that we, the audience, have been given and invested in since Battle for Zendikar. And this 
War of the Spark its final conclusion. So that being said, it is shocking that the final War of the Spark novel is centered not on the Gatewatch whatsoever, but on three characters who are not and have never been members of the Watch at all, and have no history of connection to their targets. Vraska has never had anything to do with Dovin Bon. I don't believe she even knew who he was until War of the Spark, while Chandra, our Gatewatch protagonist who has a deep and developed history with Bon, is sidelined. Vraska's hunt for Bon has no deeper meaning for her character or for any aspect of the story that we have invested in thus far. Okay, before I need to go farther, obviously now that we're talking about the characters and what they're doing and what happens to them, I think I need to indicate that we are entering spoiler territory. So spoilers and double spoiler, it doesn't matter. It's just whatever. If you haven't read it, it's not, no big letdown, but spoilers. So the same can be said for Ral Zarek being tasked to pursue Tezzeret and Kaya to pursue Liliana Vess. Jace, who from a narrative perspective should probably be the one to pursue and bring Liliana to justice, is again sidelined to having no real role beyond continuing to deteriorate his relationship with Raska to next to nothing. Imagine instead that Jace, given his long and complex history with Liliana, a history again that we have invested in as readers over literal years, has has to use what he knows about her to track Liliana down and possibly even kill her for her role in the invasion of Ravnica. Would he do it? Could he? Is Liliana worthy of forgiveness and redemption? Does her final act of betrayal against Bolas merit forgiveness for her complicitness in his plans? And can she even be considered complicit when she was acting only as a result of Bolas's force? Would Jace listen to her given that she has used and, yeah, abused him before? This exploration of character and plot is potentially rich and deep here, but avoided entirely, entirely absent because it is Kaya, the ghost assassin, who has been tasked to track down the necromancer. So get ready for several short chapters where Kaya follows her emotionlessly throughout the multiverse, Teo and Rat in tow. Yes, Rat fans, it turns out Kaya can bring living beings with her across the blind eternities, violating literally every hard rule of magic since the lore's very inception. This amazing, unique, and universe-shattering ability is offhandedly explained here. Okay, so here's the thing. Normally, planeswalkers can't take anything or anyone organic across the blind eternities to another world. Miss Ballard eyed her suspiciously. What do you mean normally? I'm the exception. I can safely take one person or creature by ghosting into my spirit form and simultaneously extending my necromagic to include my passenger, much as I do when I extend my magic over my dagger or my clothes. You cannot, Miss Ballard and Rats said, almost simultaneously, though with very different tones. I can, though. I first did it by accident with my cat, Jana who jumped into my arms at the precise moment I was about to planeswalk. Cat, rat, same principle. Incredibly blasé revelation of a universe-shattering power. Like most information, it carries no weight. It is said, it is rushed, and on we go to the next plot point. So while Jace, Chandra, Nissa, Teferi, and company are within the pages of this novel, the Gatewatch is not a part of the primary story, even though this is the conclusion of the Gatewatch's story. And I want to stress that I like characters like Kaya, Ral, and I'm especially fond of Vraska. In fact, I'd say Vraska might be my favorite Magic the Gathering character at this point, or at least she was until Weissman began writing her. Here she is presented as foolish and easily tricked throughout the novel, sheepishly avoiding Jace and not showing any signs of the power, confidence, 
sense and intelligence that the pirate captain we knew and loved throughout Ixalan demonstrated. At the end, while Jason Vraska are still technically together as a couple, they are barely a shell of their former selves, their relationship being strained due to pointless lies, misinformation, and a lack of trust. Words are powerful. Words matter. This is a story, and it's built upon words. And that brings me to the most difficult part of this novel. In the novel, Nyssa and Chandra's relationship comes to an end. This by itself is upsetting to many due to the literal years of development between the two that the magic story has invested us in. But what is more damaging is that the relationship is ended in a way that can be described as biphobic, by describing the love and attraction between Nyssa and Chandra to not only be over, but to have never existed at all. Chandra had never been into girls. Her crushes, and she'd had her fair share, were mostly the brawny and decidedly male types, like Gids. But there had always been something about Nyssa Ravain specifically, something the two of them shared in that great chemical mix, arcing between them like one of Ral Zarek's lightning bolts, that had thrilled her from the moment they first met. There is a lot to deconstruct here. These are not just words describing the conclusion of a relationship between two women, but they are words commenting on the truth behind who and how they love. Weissman writes that all Chandra's past crushes were men and that Nyssa was an exception, an aberration, not in line with her normal romantic and sexual attractions. Weissman further stresses not only that Chandra's relationships were all with men, but specifically brawny men. These words, apparently, were not sufficient enough, as Weissman further adds in parentheses, decidedly male, to emphasize what exactly? What are these words saying? What is Weissman trying to convey by stressing the concept of decidedly male at all, let alone as that being the true and consistent type of person Chandra has had relationships with? These words are saying that Chandra is not attracted to women, that what happened between her and Nyssa was an aberration, a flight of fancy, and that her real attraction is one that belongs not only to the male, but the decidedly male. Weissman is so intent on conveying the masculine role in Chandra's romantic life that he has her think not of lightning as an element between her and Nyssa, but specifically Ral Zarek's lightning, another masculine spark of attraction, this time literally. Weissman then goes further. On Ravnica, in the wake of Gideon's death and Bolas's, they had admitted to each other that they loved, but both of them knew Deep down, they were only speaking platonically. Platonic. This is the equivalent of saying that Chandra's relationship with another woman was just a phase. It is tantamount to erasing the existence of Chandra and Nyssa as a same-sex couple. And the words used are ones that can be used to erase bisexual identity and existence. It's only a phase. It was always platonic. The true attraction is men, brawny men, decidedly male. Did Weissman intend such a statement? Possibly. Is he just a terrible hack of a writer who, in a rush to meet a deadline with an imposed requirement from corporate to end Nissa and Chandra's relationship, sloppily and haphazardly used words in this way without having any awareness of what he was actually saying and conveying? Again, possibly. But of course, Weissman's work would have had to be vetted by someone at Wizards of the Coast. Someone is in charge of magic story over there. Was the idea to essentially retcon Chandra as only being attracted to men part of a larger corporate plan? A Netflix animated series starring Chandra is coming soon. Are they afraid of a non-straight central character? Is this out of worry for the Chinese market? There's no way to know any of this for sure. And in a way, 
It doesn't matter the reason, only the reality of what is written on the page. And that reality is that what is written on the page is ugly and at odds with everything Wizards of the Coast has claimed to stand for. Final grade on this, it's a failure on all levels. War of the Spark Forsaken is sloppy, poorly written, and hollow prose that does nothing to further the story of Magic the Gathering or to develop its characters. What's more, it contains harmful biphobic elements. But that, of course, is just my interpretation. Now I really want to hear from you. Did you read War of the Spark Forsaken? And if so, what did you think of it? And by the way, if you are looking for quality magic story, I will link some of the very best in this video's description. Do you have a favorite magic story from throughout the years? Let me know that too in those comments below. And this program was made possible thanks to a sponsorship from Card Kingdom, as well as the Patreon support of viewers such as you. So thank you.